Welcome. Nope. Ah. Welcome, everyone. They are working on getting the wireless fixed for me. But we will start in the interest of time. Are you having a good conference? Pretty amazing. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks for being here. Uh, so I thought this session, as soon as we get a headphone on me, I'll walk around a little bit. I thought I would start with a story from my life, my learning life, part of how I understood the learning process. And every time I go to one of these events, someone says, oh, it's brain-based, or we should understand neurosciences. Have you all heard that this weekend? That's popular, right? So I feel super guilty that I don't know a lot about the human brain. So a few years ago, I went back to school and I decided I'm gonna take a class on the human brain. So in the summer, when I have lots of free time, I made a commitment that I'm gonna go back to school and take a class on the brain. Do you all make lots of commitments in the summer about what you're gonna do next year? Yeah, yeah me too. And it was a Thursday night class, 7 p.m. until 9.40 p.m. My school starts at 7 a.m. in the morning. I don't see 9.40 p.m. very often, right? So there I am, I'm super excited, I'm very committed, and I decide I'm going to buy the book in the summer and then read it in the summer because I am busy in the fall. So the book comes to my house, and it's, I open it, I start reading, and it says, somites are blocks of dorsal mesodermal cells adjacent to the notochord during vertebrate organogenesis. I am now a struggling reader. Are you a struggling reader now? So I would like to remind us that struggle is situational. It is not part of the identity of that child. It is the situations that we create around them that require they struggle and fail or struggle and succeed. So I closed that textbook and I said, my teacher's going to teach me. So I decided to go to class that first night and my teacher says to us about halfway through the class, I don't know how you're going to learn this, but it's on the test. Now, I showed up not knowing how I was going to learn it. Now, my teacher doesn't know how I'm going to learn it. Do you see the problem in our relationship? I should have quit the class, but I was too embarrassed because I told everyone at my school that I was taking a brain class. I might have bragged just a little bit. So the next morning at school, I was talking about my upcoming failure of a brain class, and a 10th grade biology teacher said, you could borrow the 10th grade book. And there are 65 pages in this book on the human central nervous system. I can read like a 10th grader. So I read those 65 pages, and I understood them. And I was very proud of myself. And I went to class the next week. Thank you. Hold on. I went to class. Thank you very much. I went to class the next week, very proud of myself with my 65 pages of knowledge. And my teacher talked about lobes and hemispheres and blood supply. That's all in that book. And I was right there with her. I understood the class for about 15 minutes. The other two hours, no clue what she was talking about. But I had this experience because I said, I tasted success. And it feels amazing. And I want it again. And I called my colleague, my co-teacher, Nancy, on my way home from class that night, and I said to her, do we give our students enough opportunity to struggle through something and experience success? Because it feels amazing on the inside. There's no gold star or sticker you could have given me that night because I felt amazing on the inside. And I want to do that for my students. Now, I was so proud of myself that night that I pulled over on my way home from class and stopped at a bookstore. In North America, we used to have these places called bookstores. We don't have them anymore, but there used to be places where you could go and touch books before you bought them. Now, it's all Amazon for us, so it's, right, we, don't, we don't really have bookstores. So there I am looking in the bookstore, and I found this book.
a very useful book when you are a novice. Very helpful book for me because it explained things at a level I could understand it. My assigned textbook was way too hard for me. I got so motivated that I was on Amazon looking for more things to read to educate myself, and I found this book. The title is Clinical Neuroanatomy Made Ridiculously Simple Interactive Edition. There's a lot of pressure in that title. There's a lot of promise from this author, right? It's three DVDs. You pop them in the computer. It talks to you. It shows you images of the brain. It shows you, tells you what happens when that part of the brain gets damaged. It's a fantastic book for $13.95 US dollars. That's a bargain for me to learn from this book. That semester, I watched over 100 YouTube videos about the brain. I know it's surprising to you, but doctors put brain surgery on YouTube all the time. <laughs> Gross but true. You can watch them, and they talk about what part of the brain you're seeing. The public TV in our, in our city conveniently did five DVDs on the secret life of the brain. Very convenient for me that it came out that same semester. I went on the internet and I quizzed myself about my knowledge of the brain. My first night of class, my teacher gave us our course syllabus and it had a midterm and a final. That was it. I was hoping for a paper where I could go to the library virtually, read some stuff, write my paper, get my A. Nope. Midterm, final, that's it. So I practiced a lot on the internet, and I will talk to anyone who will talk to me about the human brain. The midterm comes. It is 17 pages long, single space, 200 multiple choice questions. Yeah. At the end of the test, I handed it to my teacher, and I said to her, this is the best example of total recall that I have ever seen. And my teacher said back to me, thank you. <laughs> and in my brain I said, that was not a compliment. <laughs> and I got a B plus on that midterm and I am so proud of that B plus. I have never worked harder for anything in my educational career than that brain class for which I got a B plus. Some things I learned about myself. You cannot independently learn from books you cannot read. When we send children home who are in grade 10, who currently read at grade five, with books that are grade 10, we are doing no service to them at all. There is no research evidence that says you can learn from books you cannot read independently. It takes teacher scaffolding and teacher support, but you can learn. I got a B plus in a graduate neuroanatomy course and I never read the assigned textbook. I read a lot of pages every week of things I could read. Because reading a lot builds your background knowledge and builds your vocabulary. I was reading about 400 pages a week. The other people in the class, the other 18 students in the class, were reading about 25 to 40 pages a week. But their text was way harder, mine was way easier, and I still got a B plus. Interacting with other people keeps you motivated, clarifies information, and extends understanding. There was not a single time in my class where my teacher said, turn to your partner and talk. Not one time. She never said, here's a question, could the four of you have a conversation? Never. I know better. Learning is a social endeavor. We are social animals. And we learn best when we interact with other human beings, adults and peers. That's who we are. So every Monday, I would send out an email to the 18 full-time unemployed doctoral students in the class. I was in the class too, I had a job. None of them had a job. I would send them an email every Monday and I said to them, if you meet me in the commons, that's the food area, if you meet me in the commons at four o'clock, I will buy you whatever you want to eat or drink, as long as you talk to me. So I purchased a group of friends. 
for myself with my resources. And I made them talk to me every week. And I would say to them, what was that word she was talking about? What was important last week? What are the key ideas? Sometimes I would just listen to them talk. I was the lowest achieving student in that class. The lowest. And part, a big part of my success was that time to talk and listen to other people to extend my understanding. And I think we have to make sure that happens in our classes for all of our kids. So I've told you a story about my life, and I want to ask you to consider some criteria. Was I an assessment-capable learner? In other words, did I understand my current performance? Did I know learning goals? Did I select learning strategies? Did I accept the challenge of learning? Did I seek out feedback and recognize my errors? Did I monitor my own progress? And did I recognize my learning so that I could teach others? Now, I'm going to argue some of these I did, some of them I did not do. I was not a fully assessment-capable learner yet in that situation. So with your partner, could you choose one or two of these bulleted points and say, here's some evidence that Doug was or was not assessment capable in that situation. Turn and talk and analyze my experience. <clears throat> If I could interrupt your conversations there. Thank you. So after a very long review process of reading educational sciences and learning sciences and stuff I don't normally read, Nancy, John Hattie, and I identified six factors of this idea around assessment-capable learners. And that phrase comes from New Zealand. It's a phrase that's been around for about 15 years in New Zealand where they talk about, and they don't think about like, are they assessment capable for the Cambridge assessment? That's not what they mean by that. They mean, are they ready for life? That's a phrase that's used in New Zealand. So we adopted that phrase. Here are the factors that we can defend in the research. Assessment capable learners know their current level of understanding. They know where they are today. They also know where they're going. And as teachers, we have to change some of our practices if we're going to make sure our students know their current level of performance and where they are going. Third, assessment-capable learners select tools to guide their learning. That means the teachers don't say, you must all do this right now. That also means we have to provide students lots and lots and lots of tools so they can make a selection with how they want to learn. Assessment-capable learners seek out feedback and recognize that errors are opportunities to learn. They don't wait passively for their teachers to give them feedback. They intentionally ask for feedback. I had an aha moment working on this because it used to say in the first version of this that they receive feedback. Because you know there's a difference between me giving you feedback and you accepting it and receiving it. So it used to say receive. And I was apparently resistive to what I was reading because I had this aha moment once. I was writing an email, and I said to my colleague, Nancy, would you read this email before I send it? And I had this aha moment. I am asking for feedback because I recognize that I need that feedback. 
Have you ever done that? Ask someone to read an email? Don't you wish you had someone read an email once before? Have you ever sent an email that you didn't have someone read before and you wish you hadn't sent it? I mean, yeah, that happens to us too. And the, the last two, assessment-capable learners monitor their progress towards learning and they recognize the moment they've learned something and they have opportunities to teach other people. So that's what we're gonna spend our, the rest of our hour together is on these six factors of assessment-capable learners. I'd like to point out that on John Hattie's research, assessment capable is the number two highest effect of the 252 things on the list. First is around the teachers and their collaboration, which I talked about yesterday. And number two is if we can get kids to own this learning, the assessment capable nature of it, high effect size. We call that an off the charts effect size. So the first thing we think about is that assessment-capable learners know their current level of understanding. They know where they are today, and that means their teachers help them understand where they are. See if you agree with me that this next young man knows his current level of performance when he writes, this ninja protects question nine from being marked incorrect. Now, some of the ways we help students understand their current performance is by having students self-assess. We teachers design tools and allow students to assess their own progress. Not tools we grade, tools they use as self-assessment. That's one way to get there. Another way to get there, I'm waiting for a photo, another way to get there is to have conferences with students. Talk to them about their current performance one-on-one -on -one in a private environment. Let them know where they currently are performing. Give them pre-assessments before we teach to find out where they currently are. These are options. Um, some of you are noticing that we write on our desks at our school. You know that most desks in school are actually dry erase surfaces? Do you all know that? Almost all the desks in schools are, and then we say don't write on them. That's why they're there, let them write on them. So, and then last, teaching students to estimate how difficult a task will be for them forces them to think about their current performance. This comes from a researcher named Manu Kapoor. He was in Singapore for many years. He's currently in Zurich, and he spends a lot of time thinking about how to help students estimate how difficult this task will be for them because it helps them understand where they currently are learning and where they need to go. So we have a lot of options, but as teachers, we have to think about, does each student in my class understand their current performance on what I am teaching? And when they do, then we think about where they are going. Does that learner know, here's where I am today and here's where I need to be, and do I accept that challenge for learning. I talked about teacher clarity yesterday with you as a reminder. This is an important part of our work. It helps students know the path they're on for learning. This is what's coming next. I know I'm on this journey because I know where I am today and where I need to get to. Again, teacher clarity has a high impact on students' learning. We discussed this yesterday. But a lot of students find school boring. Now, where I live, in my standards that I teach, it says in our standards, if you make a claim, you have to back up evidence for that claim. Do you, do you have a similar expectation? If you make a claim, you're supposed to back it up with evidence? Now, my president has apparently not read the standards, but, but I have, and it says, if you make a claim, you have evidence. So my first piece of evidence that school can be boring for students comes from Edgar. And my second piece of evidence that school can be boring for students is... <laughs> I'm waiting for photos. <laughs> People like Edgar. 
So today I'm going to share with you the most important, most significant, most profound lecture and the reasons that we do what we do. The importance of formatting and documenting your work in the modern language style. You will notice that this is the seventh edition. I will not accept anything less than the seventh edition, which is the most current, up-to-date, most accurate information available from the Modern Language Association. The Modern Language Association is a very convenient, somewhat cumbersome, but expedient way to do your documentation. And we are using what edition? And what edition will we be using, class? <laughs> class? It's funny because it's true. <laughs> the third area is that we teach assessment capable learners to select their own tools for learning. Yes, that means we have to introduce students to lots and lots and lots of learning tools. And then we need to provide them opportunity and space to select the tools that work for them. Just because it works for me doesn't mean it's going to be a learning tool that works for you. This is our instructional model. We've been at this for many years. It'll take me a couple minutes to explain this model. When some people see these triangles, they notice that it says <clears throat> that in some parts of the lesson, the teacher has more responsibility, and in other parts of the lesson, the students have more responsibility. Do you see that in the graphic? But some people misinterpret that you must start at the top with focus and then go down. We have never said that, and we have never written that. You can start anywhere you want. You can picture a lesson that starts with an independent task. Students enter the classroom, and they write a journal entry, or a bell work, or a do now problem. Or a class could start with a collaborative task where they talk to each other. Or a class could start with what we call focused instruction. It doesn't matter where it starts, but all four have to be done in a lesson so that students develop some habits of how to learn. So I'll go quickly on what we're looking for in a lesson in my community. I'll start with collaborative so I don't reinforce top down. Collaborative is student to student interaction, spending time interacting, discussing, dialoguing, using academic language. I talked about that yesterday, so did many other speakers, that we devote significant numbers of minutes to student to student interaction. If I go up one to guided instruction, that's when we prompt and cue and question learners, we don't tell them information. We guide their thinking by asking the next question, by giving them a hint or a clue, and then letting them work to solve it. And then if we go to the top, focused instruction is where we set the purpose for learning today, and we model our thinking. For those of you who were in the literacy session with me yesterday, I spent more time on teacher modeling, opening up our brains and demonstrating thinking for students. And at the bottom, independent, is where we ask students to practice and apply what they've been taught. I've made it sound very simple. It is actually very hard to do this every day in every classroom. That's our vision, that's our hope, that's our goal. Unfortunately, sometimes we see this classroom. I do it, now you do it. This classroom works when the students already know the content you plan to teach. So in my community, if you've ever been to San Diego, there's a place called La Jolla. Some of you are nodding your heads. You might have heard of La Jolla. It's where we keep our rich people. I was told here, we are in the rich neighborhood right now. Pilar is rich, wealthy, right? So in La Jolla is where very wealthy people live. The very wealthy people's children often already have mastered the content before they come to that grade level. So this works okay because there's a huge practice effect. But if you teach children who don't yet know the content, this classroom will not work for them. There's not enough scaffolding and interaction and support. Another quick story of my life. When I was in grade nine, my math teacher taught this way. 
I had math fifth period right after lunch. We would come in, he would say to us, one, three, five, seven, nine, and you would go to the chalkboard and you would solve that problem in front of everybody in the class, and he would publicly humiliate you or commend you based on what you put on the board. I was not very good at math, so I waited outside until he ran out of problems. And I would take the tardy rather than show the whole class I didn't know how to do math. And then when that was over, he had an overhead projector with wheels on it, and the plastic went across, and he would write and turn the wheel and write some more and turn the wheel and write some more. And my teacher wrote in blue vis-a-vis -vis marker. He had a left-hand hook for writing, so he would write on the projector like this, and his hand is shadowing so you can't see, and he often bumped it and smudged the writing, and he licked his fingers to erase. That's what I remember from math. <clears throat> I failed math. I failed at ninth grade progress report at nine weeks. I failed at semester. I failed at year. And I failed at summer school with this teacher. In 10th grade, I had a different teacher. And I went from an F to a B. Did I change that dramatically? No, my teacher did. Because this classroom doesn't support learners who don't already know the content. There is a classroom that's worse than this. Have you seen this classroom? Welcome to school. Do it yourself. I have photocopied 40 pages, stapled them conveniently so you can work at your desk for the next hour by yourself. That is not teaching. That is causing or assigning work. That is not teaching. You don't need to come to conferences if all you're going to do is go buy a workbook and make kids work in it for the next five hours. It's a waste of time. I get in trouble in the United States. We'll see how this translates. Those workbook pages, I call them shut-up sheets. <laughs> because they keep kids quiet and busy but not learning anything new. They're only doing things they already know how to do. This is the most common misapplication of our work. It's common because people are afraid of collaborative learning. And they will do everything else except allow students to interact in productive, linguistically rich ways. Because people are afraid of noise. People are afraid of going off topic with their kids. I hear this all the time. If I let them work in a group, they might go off topic. Yeah, they're doing that in the whole class anyway. Their brains are off topic, just they're looking at you, right? So we have to make the task interesting, relevant, and challenging so they'll stay with it and stick with it. So collaborative learning seems to be the hard place for teachers, myself included a few years ago. We weren't convinced that it was going to cause greater learning. So we spent a lot of time thinking about collaborative learning and giving students tools to work together. And under this umbrella term of collaborative learning, we have two concepts, group work and productive group work. Group work and productive group work both allow students to interact, and they both provide academic language development or practice. Both work. Here are the differences. Group work is better when you want someone to clarify beliefs ideas, opinions. When you talked to each other a few minutes ago, you were engaged in a group work task. I asked you to clarify some thinking. Productive group work is better when you want to consolidate understanding and use argumentation. I agree with you. I disagree with you. Where did you find that? How did you know that? When you want that language, a productive task is more important. Another difference, group work has a goal to share. I asked you a few minutes ago to share. Whereas productive group work is about problem solving. And the last difference, with group work, there is no accountability or there's only group accountability. I cannot hold all of you accountable for the conversation you had because of the structure of my lesson. But in productive group work, there's individual accountability. I am not saying that productive group work is better than group work. We use both. But I do know if a teacher never uses the productive group work column, by the middle of the year, the students will know 
my teacher will never know if we talk about the dance on Friday night. Because my teacher's over there, my group's over here, we can talk about what we want. If you go back and forth between group work and productive group work, where students know they are often accountable for the conversation, they tend to stay more focused on the learning. Here are some instructional strategies. I took a few of them. There are hundreds out there. Here are a few of them for group work. The first one, turn to your partner and. Turn to your partner and say this. Turn to your partner and do this. Turn to your partner and talk about this. That's a very common one. You just did it. You have probably heard of think, pair, share. I don't care for that one. I would rather you try think, pair, square. Here's why. The research evidence says that six students dominate 80% of classroom discourse. Do you know their names by now? Yeah. So if we want to change that, we don't do think, pair, share. Instead, we have a partnership, a partnership, a partnership, a partnership, a partnership, etc. And when I tell you to have your partnership square up, these two join these two and they have a conversation rather than bringing them back together whole class. And it increases the time on task for talk. Carousel are some visual images hung around the room. Usually there's a word bank or a sentence frame underneath the images. Students walk the room talking about the images using the vocabulary underneath or the sentence frames underneath. Novel ideas only is usually you write down three things. Three actions our character might take in the next chapter. Three new vocabulary words you learned today. Three ideas you want to share with your parents tonight. We write down three things. Then everybody stands up, the teacher starts calling on students. You say one, you say one, you say one, you say one, you say one. When you say yours, you check it off. When someone else says one of yours, you check it off. When all three of yours have been checked off, you sit down. And we play survivor. Who is the last human standing? and you get some recognition today. Now you can play that for a few days, five days, eight days, and all of a sudden the students who are seated realize this is no longer fun, so I'm gonna misbehave because I'm already out. Then you introduce, if someone standing repeats something that's already been said, and you can tell who originally said it, you are one of the survivors today. And all of a sudden the seated kids are playing the game again. <clears throat> That works for me. Opinion stations, the last one I put on here. That corner is strongly agree, that corner is agree, that corner is disagree, that corner is strongly disagree. Do you think zoos are humane places for animals from Africa? I'm not gonna ask you that question really, but I asked my students that. Because we just imported into San Diego some animals from Africa and I wanted students to talk about, was this a humane thing to do? Go to your corner. Do you strongly agree? Do you disagree? Where do you go? And you talk about that. And then we read some articles about saving the northern white rhinos. And they took them to the San Diego Zoo because we have a very well-known international conservation program. And we plan to save the northern white rhinos. But they're in captivity now. They're not in the wild. So there's a pro and a con. And the students had an awesome conversation about their beliefs. They came back to their tables, they read some primary source documents, and then they went back to their corners to talk about do they agree or disagree with what they read. It gets them moving and talking. Here are some of the productive group work routines. These have individual accountability to them. Yesterday in the literacy session, I folded one of your pieces of paper that I stole from you at the audience, and I made a conversation roundtable. So if you remember that yesterday, hamburger, hot dog, triangle, open it up, four quadrants, rhombus in the middle. If you weren't here yesterday, you missed it. Sorry. That's one of them. Numbered heads together. Every table has a number. Each person at the table has a number. This is a Kagan strategy. So you're number one, you're number two, you're number three, but you're at table four. You roll the dice. You have, sorry, you have a conversation. You roll the dice. And then you say, it's going to be person four. Make sure person four at your table can answer. They talk a second time, making sure person four can answer. Roll the dice, table six, person four, you're on. Roll the dice, table three, person four, you're on. And it has individual accountability because of the dice. Reciprocal uh, literature circles and reciprocal teaching, each of those have a role assignment, R-O-L-E, role assignment. You are the predictor, you are the summarizer. 
You are the person who does the illuminating lines. You're the vocabulary enhancer. You have a job to do while you read with your peers. And you take notes with that job, and I can hold you accountable for that job. Jigsaw, those of you who were at the literacy session yesterday, I said strategies are limited to surface or deep or transfer. Do you remember that? Jigsaw is the one exception. There is published research on Jigsaw that it works at surface and deep and transfer. It's the only one in the entire literacy world that has evidence published that it works for all three phases of learning. It's a very useful approach to divide the text, have multiple conversations and multiple groupings. The last one, collaborative poster. You give each group a piece of chart paper, um, A5. Does that work for you? How big is A5? Do you have paper like that? Huh. A5 works for me. I just made up that number. I knew it was bigger than A2. Is there an A9? OK. So anyway, so that piece of paper, you give each group one, and you give each student a different color marker. They can only write on the paper in their assigned color. And you walk around. Tell me why you wrote that in red. Tell me why you wrote that in blue. And you have individual accountability for the group interaction. Now, some cynic in here will say, what if she tells her what to write in red? Yes, that's called collaborative learning. <laughs> I want them telling each other the information. But I don't want them to say, the answer is 24. That's not helpful. The answer is 24 because, how did you know that? Where did you find that? I agree with you. I disagree with you. That's productive. That's what I'm looking for. So in group work, I don't actually care about the answer. I care about the language around the answer. So when I come to you and say, you got 24, how did you do it? Even if your peer taught you that just now, now it's coming out of your mouth. It's not yet independent. It's collaborative. And I'm OK with students telling each other the answer as long as they talk about it. So every day in every class, we're looking for some collaborative learning, some teacher guided, some independent, so that students can develop their own habits. But remember I said yesterday, study skills. Study skills are really important. Teaching students how to study. The study skills research has three major parts to it. It says there are cognitive skills. These are the ones most of us remember putting things on note cards and flashing through them, trying to remember vocabulary words, that is a cognitive skill. Taking notes is a cognitive skill. Summarizing a lecture is a cognitive skill. Summarizing a chapter of a book, a cognitive skill. That's part of study skills. There are also metacognitive study skills, teaching students self-management tools to study. Where do you study? At what time do you study? What environment do you use to study? Did you plan your studying? Did you put it in your phone and say, at this time, I'm going to plan some time to study? Do you monitor your studying? And then there's a part of affective study skills where you talk about your motivation and your reflection on your studying and getting your self-concept. I am a student, therefore I study. It's part of my definition. So it takes all three of these to build study skills. There's an interesting set of um, a meta-analysis that came out last November, and it was on practice testing. So three days, four days before you gave the real assessment, and it could be an essay assessment, a multiple choice constructed response, dichotomous, you gave some sort of assessment. Three or four days before you gave the real assessment, you gave a practice version of that assessment. The students who got the practice version scored better on the real version. Are you surprised by that? They saw, not the same questions, but they saw a version of it four days before. They scored better on the real assessment a year later. That's interesting to me. But here's the key to this practice testing. The teacher did not score the practice test the students did. And the students formed study groups based on their performance on the practice test. And a year later, they still outperformed the students who didn't do it in statistically significant ways. To me, that's easy to implement. 
I could do that tomorrow. I could decide, here's a big assessment I'm going to give. It's going to be an essay. Four days before, we're going to have a practice version. Students are going to score it, and they're going to form study groups so they can figure out what they still need to learn in the four days before I give them the real version. And they are very likely to remember it a year later. So the researchers called it a practice test study. I actually believe it was a study skills study. I think they tricked those kids into studying by giving them a practice test. Assessment-capable learners seek out feedback. They don't wait around for it on Friday. They know when it is time for feedback. Not all feedback is effective, though, so I want to be careful about that. We have to teach students who look for feedback. Here's an example of feedback being not so effective. I figure 75% to you, Pan Ma, and 25% divided between the five of us, Yida, Crowbar, myself, Tom, and the baby. That makes 5% for each one of us. Ah, uh, 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 Billy, you're cheating yourself. If there's 25% divided among the five of you, that's 14% apiece. Oh, no, listen, Pa. I, I wouldn't cheat you. You know I wouldn't. Now, look. Look here. I'll show you. Let me rub this out here. And now, 25 divided by 5 is 5. You see, you, 5 won't win a 2, will it? No. But five goes into 25 five times, you see? No, you're wrong, Billy. Now, now I'm a pretty good mathematician. Now, five into 25, five won't go into two, will it? No. But five goes into five once. Now, we didn't use the two before, so we bring it down here. Now, five into 20 goes four times. There you are, five into 25, 14. No, look, Pa, now, let me prove it to you now by modification. Uh, five times five, five times five is 25. Really, I'm surprised you're learning. Huh? I'm surprised that you're learning. Now I'll show you. Five times 14 is 25. Five times four is 20. Five times one is five. Twenty-five. That's it. No, no. Look, Ma. See, look, you're, you're wrong there because you know, I'll, I'll, pro I'll prove it to you. I'll, we'll put down four, five fourteens here. Fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. There. Now, now I'll prove to you by addition that, that five fourteens is not twenty-five. Four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, there you are. Better brush up, Billy. I don't want to see you boys cheated. And we've all had that day. When the learner is not ready for the feedback, they probably become immune to the feedback. Now, I know this is TV, this is fake, but it reminds me that if a learner is not ready for that feedback, they, don't, they either are compliant and they fix what you tell them to fix because that's who you are, their boss, their teacher, or they don't like it, they don't learn from it. We've been teaching students to seek out feedback. It can be as simple as making a little table tent out of paper, and on one side working, on the other side feedback. And we try our best not to interrupt them until they turn the card to feedback. So they learn to recognize it is time for feedback on my learning. It is hard as their teacher, because you've walked by, you see errors, and you want to jump in, and you want to rescue. But we're trying to get to the place where students recognize it is time for me to seek out feedback. Feedback works when the learner is ready for it. Same with all of you as teachers. When your coaches, when your administrator gives you feedback that you don't want, you sit there politely and nod your head. And I'm not going to change it. You, could, you weren't here five minutes before. You couldn't teach this class. You all know what I'm saying. None of you can look because your bosses are here. I know. I get that. So in elementary school in San Diego, we started this helping curriculum. And this is a poster we made, and it's in all of our classrooms in elementary school. Did you offer help today? Did you ask for help today? Did you accept help today? And did you nicely decline and try it yourself? This was motivated when we listened to Jim Nottingham and some of you 
heard yesterday some of the things from the challenge group about the learning pit. How do we not get kids out of the learning pit when they're in it? How do we not just rescue them? So we created this helping curriculum to say, we're going to teach students how to specifically request help, accept help, decline help, and offer help. Those four parts need to be really embedded into the way schools operate. So it's not just the teacher. It's all the peers and understanding help. And over time, that led us to say, if we're doing all this work about help and feedback with our students, why aren't we doing it with teachers as well? So every one of us has one of these. This is uh, Mr. Asaf. He teaches advanced mathematics. Please welcome, please observe our class. As the teacher, I am working on making learning intentions and success criteria more visible to students. I look forward to feedback. Now imagine you have 10 minutes and you think, you know, I'm going to stop by Mr. Asaf's classroom because he asked for feedback on this. If someone is asking for feedback on something, they are way more responsive to getting that feedback. If you walk in his classroom and say, I didn't like your seating arrangement, he's probably going to say, so what? That's my seating arrangement, not your seating arrangement. But if you say, that learning intention was really clear, but the success criteria was kind of confusing, can we have a conversation about that? He's probably going to be way more open to it because that's what he asked for in feedback. So we started this as a teacher to teacher. So when people had time, they would go peer visit each other. And our high school students started giving their teachers feedback in kind, wonderful ways. I overheard a student, his name is Asher, say to his teacher, Mr. Asaf, Mr. Asaf, you should go see Mr. Vaca. His learning intentions are really good, way better than yours. <laughs> and he wasn't being mean at all. He was trying to give feedback in a helpful way because he knows his teacher is working on that. And what if we did invite our students in to say, here's something I'm working on as a teacher. I know here's what you're working on as a student. I'm going to give you feedback, and you can give me feedback. Assessment-capable learners <clears throat> know how to monitor their progress. They know where they're going, and they know the steps along the way. That requires we change our teaching practices to allow students opportunities, <clears throat> opportunities and tools to monitor their own progress. Next, you'll meet Sarah. She's five years old. And Sarah is going to talk to you about her writing development. And I'm going to ask you to think about Sarah's ability to monitor her own progress. Sarah, can you tell us how this chart works? We'll point to them and tell us about it. I know nobody's on this, but some people might not be on this. How come? Because some people won't do that because we're in kindergarten, but some people might do that. Good. Now go further up the chart and tell us about the middle of it, Sarah, around the orange crayon. Well, some people sound it out and try and make their letters neat on this one. Good. And what about further up the chart, Sarah? Then what happens? On this one, they try to sound it out. They try to make their letters neatly and try to make the thing right. This is where I am. I sound it out. I try to keep them nicely written. I try to make the right words. I try to keep the letters with a space before they start. And I'm going over to here because it's the last step and I'm over at the nine step. This is the 10 step. Sarah's five years old, and she's monitoring her progress because her teacher provided her tools and experiences to do so. Sarah did not show up in kindergarten on the first day knowing how to do that. Her teacher made sure she knew how to do that. Her teacher gave her tools, and her teacher gave her experiences for her to be able to say, Here's where I am on this writing rubric. Here's my evidence that I'm at this level on my writing rubric. And here are some experiences that I'm going to have. And here's where I'm going when my learning journey for writing has mastered the kindergarten standards. 
And I would argue that if a five-year-old can do this, it seems reasonable that a nine-year-old can do it. Because I know you don't all teach five-year-olds. But if a five-year-old can do what you just saw, don't you think a nine-year-old could? Don't you think a 15-year-old could? Don't you think a 35-year-old could? Shouldn't we be on the same learning journey? Shouldn't we be able to say, here's where I am in my teaching, here's where I want to get next in my teaching, here are the resources I need to get there, just like a five-year-old? That's what we're trying to accomplish, because these six characteristics are also about you, not just your students. They apply to you just as well. Are you monitoring your own progress as you get better every year at engaging your students? Now, some of you don't teach kindergartners and you don't like what that example, but maybe you'll like this one better. Instead of you collecting the exit slip at the door on the way out, what if students self-assess their own exit slip? And they put it in a box, said, number one, I'm just learning this. I need help. Number two, I'm almost there. I need some practice. Number three, I own it. I can work by myself. Number four, I am a pro and I can teach other people. And it will work <clears throat> if you actually do something tomorrow with those papers. If students put their papers in a box and nothing happens to them and the next day and the next day and the next day nothing happens, they're going to walk by and throw them in randomly. But if they know the path to assistance is by being honest about their current level of learning, they become very critical of their work and you will see them at the door deciding on the box and thinking carefully about where they're going to place that because they know the next day's lesson will be based on where they put their work, provided the teacher agrees. There are times when a student puts it in box one and we think it belongs more in a box three. That's a great conversation. Or a student who puts it in box three and we really think it belongs in box one. That's a great conversation. Imagine giving the students in box four some extended work or some peer tutoring opportunity. And the students in box one some opportunity to be retaught the content the next day. They become very, very honest when they have opportunities to monitor their own progress. The last factor we look for is that assessment-capable learners recognize their learning and they teach others. And this is something I feel like in San Diego we have forgotten. The power of peer tutoring. The power of setting up opportunities for students to formally assist their peers in class and across grade levels. Peer tutoring has a very powerful effect. It's 0.55 effect size. We should be mobilizing opportunities for our students to teach each other. There's one of us and 20 some of them. Imagine the power of learning if we could mobilize peers. And yesterday we heard the third teacher is the environment, but the second teacher that was named was the peers. We should be using all of those resources. We should be using us as adults. We should be mobilizing the peers and the learning environment to create the best opportunities we can for our students. So again, the six factors. Assessment-capable learners know their current understanding. They know where they're going. They take on challenges of learning. They select tools to guide their learning. They learn to seek out feedback, not wait passively for it. They recognize that errors are opportunities to learn, which means we create a culture that we celebrate when students make errors. We don't shame, humiliate, or embarrass them. Errors are exciting. If an hour goes by in a classroom and there's not a single error, they didn't learn anything, they already knew it. Errors are opportunities to learn. We teach students to monitor their progress, adjust their learning, recognize when they have learned something so that they can teach the next person. That, again, thank you for your time. Enjoy the conference. <clears throat>